Hi, good evening, everyone. My name's Mark, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Maria Brito in conversation with Josh Spector, discussing how creativity rules the world, the art and business of turning your ideas into gold. Uh, for regular updates on BookSoup's upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, click the Like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, consider supporting our bookstore and the author's work by purchasing a copy of today's featured book, How Creativity Rules the World. Just click on the green Purchase button below, directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process uninterrupted from the video stream. Now, a few words about our featured guest. Josh, Spe Josh Spector helps creative entrepreneurs grow their audience and business. As a consultant, writer, and publisher for the popular For the Interested newsletter, he advises people and companies on how to best produce, promote, and profit from their creations. Prior to launching a successful independent consulting business, Josh was Managing Director of Digital Media and Marketing for the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, the organization behind the Oscars. He's also previously worked with New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers TV, Sony Pictures Television, Comedy.com, and The Hollywood Reporter. Maria Brito is a New York-based contemporary art advisor, author, and curator. She's a Harvard Law School graduate, originally from Venezuela. Brito was selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world, and she was named by Art News as one of the innovators who gets to shape the art world. She's written for publications such as Entrepreneur, Huff Huffington Post, L, Artnet, Forbes, Cultured Magazine, Departures, Goop, and the Gulf Coast Journal of Literature and Fine Arts from the University of Houston, Texas. Maria has curated art exhibits in three continents and also created and hosted The Sea Files with Maria Brito, a TV and streaming service for PBS's station All Arts. For several years, Maria has taught variations of her creativity class and companies and also designed and launched Jumpstart, a comprehensive online program on creativity for, for artists, freelancers, managers, and entrepreneurs based on years of practical work, research, and observation in both the worlds of business and art. She lives in New York City with her husband and two sons. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Maria and Josh. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation, everyone. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Maria, and congratulations on the launch of the book. No, uh, thank you. You know, you're my favorite Angelino, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I should have added that to my intro. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who's uh, watching and checking this out. Uh, we appreciate it. I assume you're here because uh, you are really interested in and love and appreciate creativity and like to be creative and would like to be more creative. And Maria's book can certainly help you with all of that. Uh, for me, one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons why I, I love this book and I'm excited to talk to you about it is because you frame creativity as not just this thing for artists, but really a set of tools and processes that almost anyone can use to help them get better at whatever they want to do and accomplish their goals. So I think that's, uh, you know, and I'll let you sort of get into how you approach that. But I think it's important to kind of say up front that this isn't just about how to be a better painter or, or that <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I know uh, I've known Maria for a little while, but it was interesting in reading the book. You, you open with the story of your grandfather and your backstory and your sort of mm -hmm. initial connection to creativity, which is amazing. And as someone who even knew you and knew your work, I didn't know any of that. And it, and it sort of was uh, this amazing story that kind of sets the whole table. So I thought that would be a good place for us to start if you want to sort of a give a little bit of his story and sort of its impact on, on you and yes. sort of the perception of creativity. 
Definitely. Uh, thank you, everyone who's here tonight. I absolutely love and appreciate each one of you. Uh, it's 9 p.m. here, and I'm, you know, reeling with the exhilaration of launching a book. But yes, thank you, Josh, for the question. My grandfather was a man of many talents, and uh, he went to uh, medical school in Venezuela, and he graduated with honors in you know the 1940s and uh he practiced as an OBGYN for many years and he had a little accident where he wasn't as dexterous as he wanted to be right and so he he came clean with himself and he said i can't do my job i can't bring babies i can't i cannot operate people as i used to and therefore he said to himself, I'm going to venture myself into a new career. And my grandfather was the child of Lebanese immigrants who ended up in Venezuela because funnily enough, they left Lebanon and, and said they wanted to go to America, wanting to come to the United States. And they ended up in Venezuela, right? Because it was like they took a boat and whatever, and they ended up there. But bottom line is my, my grandfather took this job. His family had a bank in Venezuela. They had founded a bank and built it from scratch. And he, he said, I'm going to go work there because, you know, I was a doctor, but now I can figure out my life there. And so he went and in a very short period of time, he became one of the top three guys in the bank. And this was the early 70s in Venezuela. And he was kidnapped by the guerrilla, by a group of men who were trained by Fidel Castro, and they had infiltrated Caracas, where I was born and where my grandfather lived, because they uh, wanted to, you know, it was time of protest. It was like the anti-imperial and whatever. So my grandfather spent a month in a rainforest with um, duct tape around his eyes, and his, uh, he had a straight jacket. He didn't know if he was going to live. Uh, honestly, and he was just taking it all in. And, you know, he spent all those days in silence, pretty much. He was fed once a day. And uh, behind the scenes, what was happening is that my grandmother and my grandfather's brother were trying to put together the money for the ransom. And it was um, it was about half a million dollars back in, in 1971. That's about $5 million today. And, uh, you know, Luckily, it, it, like they didn't kill my grandfather, but all the money he had went for that ransom, all the money. And so it was a loan also like, you know, so basically my grandfather uh, had to reinvent his life again because he didn't want to go back to the bank. And he bought a printing company and uh, he was incredibly happy with his printing company. That was the money that he took uh, for a loan. And on the weekends, he used to paint on easel. Like he had a, an easel and he invited me and he was really an incredible dude with the definition of creativity, reinvention, willingness to embrace life from many different aspects. So that's kind of like in a nutshell, how I open uh, the story of me and my, and actually what happened to me, and this is um, also in the book, is that in May of 2020, where we're like a year, a month and a half or two months in the lockdown and whatever. And so I am in New York City with where I have lived for the past 22 years. And I'm, I have a husband and two kids. And so, you know, it's been locked down. We're all kind of like mad at each other, but like trying to figure out our lives, right? And so, I Googled my grandfather's name randomly because honestly, my grandfather has been dead for now 18 years, but at the time it was 16 years that he has been, he had been dead. I Googled his name and I found a video uh, of the day that he was released and it was on a Reuters webpage and he had something that I had never seen in my life because nobody wants to keep clips of their they they become released from kidnapping when my you know that in the 70s that there was no internet this i don't know how or why this ended up on that web page i mean i know that it was international news and it was all over you know it was in the new york times it was on time magazine it wasn't every because it was a big thing that a guy was a banker he was kidnapped and the gorilla and the world was kind of like different at that time and that's, those were news that were around the world and I found that video and really I just cried my eyes out because I was like, either he's trying to send me a message or 
you know, like life has become so crazy in the past few years. And now with this pandemic, right, I felt so much like him, isolated from the world, silence, you know, considering why I have this closet full of shoes and shit that I'm not get, never going to wear, you know what I mean? So that's kind of like that, finding that video was the catalyst for me to start writing the book. Mm -hmm. And so let's, so with that, with that in mind, which is just like a, a wild story and I can't even imagine what it was like to see that video after all those years. Um, so let's talk about that. So that inspires you to, I want to start writing a book about creativity and let's start with, you know, lots of people have their own sort of definitions of what creativity is and what it means to be creative. How do you talk about your perception of those terms and what it means and sort of how you address them in the book? Well, I have been obsessed with this idea of creativity for a long time because as a business owner, remember that I was a corporate attorney before. Uh, 13 years ago, I quit a career as a corporate attorney to open a company in a completely unrelated field, which is what I do as an art advisor. And now also I have an innovation, creativity consulting practice and whatnot. But when I transitioned, and I actually was able to get the business to become an industry leader and whatnot, people started asking me, how do you do that? How are you so creative? How, where do you find these ideas, right? And how could you differentiate yourself? And, um, you know, the world is saturated everywhere, right? Is the point of creativity is being able to differentiate what you do from the rest and do it in a way that leaves value and an impression, right? That is positive and that impacts others differently. And uh, my, my clients, they are collectors. Some of them were uh, CEOs of companies and they said to me, look, why don't you come and give a workshop to our managers and tell us how you do what you do, how artists think, what is creativity to you? Because we feel sometimes stuck in so many processes and procedures and we just really want to open up you know like your ideas in your head and understand where these ideas come from and so creativity is no more than your unique ability to come up with ideas of value that are relevant for this world right now right and that is something that is available to everybody no matter what you do if you are an accountant and if you are a teacher if you are a writer if you are an artist if you are a, an entrepreneur in fact entrepreneurship can't survive without creativity because the whole idea of bringing a new business a new idea a service to the world in the world that we live that again has seen it all and if you do not bring a creative aspect to it and you're not willing to adjust it every now and then you're not going to be able to survive the truth is and we don't even want you to survive we want you to thrive that's uh for most people the act of going on your own as a freelancer or as, or as a business owner is because you want to thrive, not because you want to just survive. I mean, yeah, running a business is a hell of work. It's very difficult. But the point is that you are in command of what you do, how you present yourself, the things that you do, the way that you serve your clients. So that's yeah. kind of like what I think, you know, about creativity nowadays. Yeah, and I think it's interesting sort of piggybacking off that, that, you know, there are so many people, you know, in the book, you break down a lot of sort of the myths that people have about creativity. And, you know, I think uh, among those, especially with the sort of entrepreneur business side, is this idea that like, oh, I'm not a creative person, right? Like, I think you might have, and, you know, and again, you were a lawyer, I'm guessing most lawyers, if you ask them, you would know better than me. But I would guess most lawyers would say, oh, I'm not creative. That's that's not what I do. Right. Right. And there's a lot of these myths that, that they believe. So can you talk a little bit about sort of some of the common myths around creativity and why and how you found like they're not true to sort of poke some holes in and all the reasons people have that they can't be, be creative or do creative things? Well, you know, I wrote a whole chapter about the myths because this is one of those things that. 
as you very well said, is they are ingrained in people's minds, right? And so what is like, I'm not an artist. So the, the, the thing is people tend to confuse artistic talent with creativity. If you can sculpt something like Michelangelo did, that is artistic talent, right? But he was also highly creative. However, I can't do that. But I can do a million things in my business, in my in how I post on Instagram. There are newsletter that I write, how I present my business to the world, the things that I need to change and tweak. Uh, if I'm an early adopter of something, if I try to do something that you know it is, um, it actually represents my brand but like it's because of my convictions it's because of my authenticity it's because with my autonomy right so the mm -hmm. first thing is like creativity is not just for artists and you know like examples uh thomas alva edison or you know elon musk or steve jobs those guys are not artists but they are some of the most creative minds in history because they saw an opportunity to do something that nobody else was doing it right and so and how they presented the elements and and creativity is a lot about making associations so you know from building an electrical car to inventing the smartphone those things are not just from scratch cars have existed phones right. have existed right it's like how do you recombine all those elements actually what makes you an innovator a disruptor a creative thinker and uh, you know what another of the myths is the right brain and left brain mm -hmm. that's not true the brain needs both parts to work optimally right and it is uh it was discovered and and it's super well explained by eric Kendall, who is a nobel prize in physiology he was the one who actually debunked all these things of the right and left uh because it's it's mythology right like we when people say i'm, I'm for example people who are excellent at math i have my my two kids and my husband are excellent at math and i'm not right and yeah. so but they are brilliantly creative and they are coding and like you know you think mark zuckerberg is not creative and what is he doing all day long he still codes right. you know so like i mean and like by the same token right like you have artists whose main skill is painting or whatever but they are also marketing themselves in a different way and they are posting on Instagram and they are selling NFTs for, you know, $69 million. And so it's not one thing or the other. It's like you may have abilities that actually lie on one, you know, on one area where you're better or you know or you also pick and choose when i was a child i just didn't like math and period and maybe i made that for my own self in my head that i just didn't like it and that i wasn't good at it and i just wanted to be on the other side of things where we were reading and poetry and dancing and that was my favorite thing but it's you know that doesn't it doesn't take away like the you were gonna when you read the book you will see how um how crazy we've been all this time which is also a disservice to ourselves to consider ourselves right-brained or left-brained is a mythology is a fallacy it doesn't exist the other thing that people say is like i wasn't born creative mm -hmm. two things there is a whole myth uh there is a whole uh i i well, I love there's some studies you reference in the book that are amazing about that about measuring right. creativity in kids and then as they as they go on that was a groundbreaking study that it nobody even needed to do it again because it was so good. And uh, this Dr. George Land, he already passed away and NASA hired him and said, look, we want you to develop a specific test because NASA wanted to put the most creative people in the hardest tasks, right? Like the, the most advanced engineers and scientists and whatever, within the organization within nasa nasa said i want the most creative people in the most difficult challenge in like in challenging tasks so this guy came in and he developed a test and the thing worked so well and uh, it was so accurate too that he said okay let's do it with kids so they started measuring kids at the age of i think three or four with similar tests but adapted for their ages right and so 98 percent of the kids scored at the highest percentile of creativity then the same little kids were tested again when they were eight and then it was like okay 
80%, and so on and so forth until they were the, the same children were, were, were 30. And at that time, only 2% scored at the highest level of creativity. So what this says basically is that the combination of formal education, there's nothing wrong with formal education if you go to learn certain things, right? But like when they teach you how to think, and what to think and yeah. they give you like you know these are the rules and america for example is obsessed with a standardized test right that doesn't measure brightness that doesn't measure creativity that only says you're excellent at taking a standardized test yeah. that's the truth right but this is what we use like the lsat and the sat and the hsat and that, you know and so also, the amount of no's and rules and regulations that we are constantly listening to. And also, amount. also all those people who hear that growing up that they're not creative. Oh, you're not like those artists. You know, you're not, <laughs> you, know, you know, you're not, you know, you're good at math. You're not creative, right? Like how many people sort of hear that kind of stuff? And so they start to assume that, you know, again, going back to like the lawyer example, like, probably lots of lawyers or accountants are like, I guess I'm not creative because I don't do that, what they perceive as creative things. And it's not, it doesn't mean they're not capable of it. And this is uh, one of the things that I really, uh, I'm on a mission with this book is to try to open up the creative mind for every human being who gets their hands on this book, because it is the most precious skill that you will rely on really for the rest of your life in terms of growth, development of your career. I mean, Josh, you know, like you help creative people yeah. you ha and you yourself have had one of the most incredible careers in different organizations that are I mean, it's like a dream, a Hollywood dream, right? <laughs> it's a Hollywood dream. It's a Hollywood dream <laughs> behind, like behind the cameras, behind the cameras, because yeah. you could be in front, but like, and- No, and but it's interesting because one of the things that I've seen even recently, I've started referring to kind of as my own core audience as creative entrepreneurs, whereas I used to just call them creators. And it's because a lot of who I work with are entrepreneurs who are using creativity and doing creative things to get what they to get what they want right i didn't want people to see oh he works with creators i'm not a creator right it's like yes you are yes you are yes you can be you might just have your own unique your unique your own unique approach to it and it's funny because you were talking about your your mission with this book and trying to help people realize that and do that and it's actually a perfect segue to the next thing i wanted to talk to you about was you know, one of the things I love it, about the book, and we had talked about this actually before it even came out, was how do you write a book that doesn't just give people interesting stories and information, but is actually actionable, right? How do you write a book that they can read it and actually go implement these things? And you came up with this concept of the alchemy labs at the end of each chapter. So you want to talk a little bit about what those are and maybe an example or two of, of how they work? Yes. So when I was writing the book, I had to obviously look around to other books on the topics of creativity that they are very good. But my only complaint was like, OK, they they don't tell me anything about how can I actually implement this in my life because they give you information. They are some of them were highly academic. Some some people I really respect uh, like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who died, he was actually in California, one of the most important researchers on, and a psychologist, very serious on the topic of creativity. He wrote a beautiful book called Flow that is a, one of the most like super national bestseller, Harper Perennial, whatever. So that's an amazing book. But, but also he's like, he places this creativity in the hands of like the Nobel Prizes. And uh, so what's in it for me, dude? Because I'm not, earn, you know, I'm not winning the Nobel Prize right. anytime soon, but I still want to put out my ideas in the world and I want to make money with them, actually, by the way, because hello, I live in New York City, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I have to I have to pay for this taxes and this insane mortgage. And so I wanted to give people a series of exercises prompts, ideas to think about at the end of each chapter that related to what they learned 
in the previous pages. So I call them alchemy labs because I think that everybody's an alchemist who can turn your ideas into gold. And I hope you will when you read this book. And I like those exercises came from jumpstart my course. So I have been, you know, I, when the CEOs I referred before invited me to their companies to give workshops, I started putting together a program for those companies when I went, you know, half a day, one day, whatever. And they all had so much fun. And, you know, obviously this is personal work. I can give you the tools. I can write the book. I can do anything. But if you don't do them, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, I mean, it's like you will be entertained with a book, but if you don't apply, the book comes alive in those alchemy labs, right? right? And when I gave when I gave them to my students at Jumpstart, I saw very similar results. I mean, people are like, wow, there is so much to uncover and unpack in my own life when I put these things in practice. I couldn't believe it, right? Like, I couldn't believe it. So one of the examples or one of the exercises is, you know, there is a lack of attention. We are all drowned in information, noise, news, wars, pandemic, social media, whatever. So there is a lot. Our our attention span is is very is is low, and also we are missing great business opportunities or creative opportunities, whatever you want to call them, right? To serve ourselves and our businesses better, to serve others, to come up with ideas, and so. I like to, uh, I reference a study in the book uh, of a professor in uh, Yale, the dermatology is, um, he's a dermatologist and he's a professor and he realized that his students, actually first year medical students could not uh, speak about the condition of a patient who was in the emergency room with actual, you know, like, like really describing their symptoms. So, so they missed a lot of the things. And he developed a course that uh, now became mandatory for every first year student at Yale Medical School. And it is about looking at paintings for at least 15 minutes, historical paintings from the Yale British Art Center. Because he saw that when the students described a painting, they wouldn't miss anything. They said the man was wearing a black hat and he had a blue shoe and like, but when they were looking at the patient on, you know, the, the, the bed, they couldn't tell what was happening with the patient. And after they did that course, after the students did the course, their observation skills improved dramatically. So one mm -hmm. of the exercises I put in the book is actually, you can look at art, you can go to the Google project online, the Google Art project, or you can go somewhere in person, but let's say you're in your computer and, or you can go to the Louvre website and pull something from anybody and just start describing those things to yourself. And another one that is really, and that, if you do that once a day, and, or even like once every two days, you're going to see an incredible performance in your observation skills, how that's going to improve. But another it's like, thing, it's like training yourself to notice things and, and sort of see differently. Absolutely. And there is another one that I like to do, uh, which is paying attention to things on the shelves of, uh, you know, drugstores, for example, because we go in and out and we just like, okay, the toothpaste, whatever. And so, but have you ever navigated like, you know, makeup or like, have you, for example, like, if, if like lots of people here live in LA, you know, you have Chinatown, you have other, other neighborhoods that you can go into those stores and like find things that you have never seen before. Right. Mm -hmm. I like, I am, I, I live in Chelsea and I go like sixth Avenue and 13th street It's like around that area is filled with Japanese stores that I, honestly, I feel ashamed myself that I, I live five, like 10 blocks or five blocks from there and I've never been. And then like as I discovered them, I like literally went every day because it's like Japanese stores where are like all the Japanese products that you can imagine. And so from like chips, like potato chips to, you know, hair dye. So I just went and I described everything to myself, like, and I went and I checked and I saw, you know, wow, this is amazing. So becoming a, a tourist in your own life for a couple of hours, right, can also do wonders for your creativity because part of being creative is being able to see what other people miss. And if you're always running around and if you're always sort of like, you know, taking everything for granted, you're going to miss everything that's happening in the periphery. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It also goes, it also connects with what you were saying before, where, you know, 
this core idea that creativity isn't really coming up with something out of nothing. It's building from connecting things that you have been exposed to or been inspired by, right? So it naturally goes that the more stuff you expose yourself, the more you notice, the more the more uh, building blocks or foundation you have to play with to create new uh, to create new ideas. And I notice that myself all the time, right? I see something completely unrelated. And then three days later, I'm having a conversation with someone and I'm like, oh, you know, like to use your example, right? Like it might be like, oh, you know what? What would your version of this product in the Japanese store be? Right. 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 Um, so let's uh, another thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, when we were talking before I had asked you sort of which of the chapters like you noticed were really resonating with people. And you mentioned that a lot of people who have read the book already sort of have a response to the the chapter on improvisation. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to have you share a little bit about your sort of take on improvisation and, and maybe give some key takeaways for, for people who haven't read the book yet. Well, I think that this is something that people like because in the past two years, we've had to improvise, right? So many things have had to kind of like be recreated on the go. And, uh, you know, for, from restaurants who've had to go and build entire, you know, canopies and things outdoors and take out services that didn't exist. Everybody on Zoom and things like that. It's a lot of improvisation. But basically, um, why improv is important is because for people who have been able to master a particular area or people who are experts on a field that's the space where you are most going to get a benefit if you improvise right and so I, for example, talk about, I wrote about Jackson Pollock, how he started painting traditional landscapes and, you know, people and whatever. And so one day he was like, oh, I already know all of that. Let me just start just splattering things, you know, on a canvas on the floor with, a, you know, a, a knife and, a, you know, a stick. And like, he wasn't even using a brush, right? So that's one of the examples. But for example, I also bring this idea of, uh, the yes and technique, which was uh, pioneered by an acting coach, Del Close, but it was also, it's it's been used in business schools by different people and whatever, and it is about having a conversation going with an improvisation moment, right? Like, so yes and, so when when, for example, a client comes and gives you like a crazy request and says, well, I want you to have this done for tomorrow. And you know, that's impossible. You say, yes. And let's review the scope of this together to make sure that it is possible to deliver tomorrow. Why is that? Why is that? And listen, it's an improvisation that is scary because you don't know what the, you know, you don't know if the client is going to say, okay, well, so I will be waiting for that tomorrow. But the thing is, why is this yes and technique important is because people like to hear yes, no matter who they are, right? Like they like to hear yes. And yes, yes I agree. Right. So the <laughs> yes and gets the ball rolling. It gets the conversation going. It doesn't shut the whole thing down. Because if you say no, there's no more conversation. And so I also... Uh, made a uh, reference to Shonda Rhimes because mm -hmm. she was completely against, you know, doing media appearances and uh, about like going to, for example, uh, commencement speeches. She was turning everything down and the world didn't know who she was. Right. And so they liked the the series great anatomy and they like they like all those things, but they didn't know who Shonda Rhimes was. And her sister told her, you always say no to everything. And that was a really kind of like scathing words. And she's like, okay, I'm going to go for my year of yes. And it was improvisation too, because she wanted to say no. Right. And uh, she pushed herself to say yes. And that, you know, after she said yes for a whole year, doors that were kind of not, not it's not that doors were closed for her, but the new, the world liked her more. And that's when she got the $100 million uh, contract with Netflix and whatever. So and she did, I think she did a Ted talk about that, right? I'm not I'm sure, sure, but she wrote a whole book about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. She wrote a whole book, the year of yes. So improvisation in business, in art, in whatever you do, 
comes when you have sufficient command, right, of what you do. And sometimes you don't have 100% command or mastery of what you do, but you still need to improvise. So it is that space of experimentation mm -hmm. that is actually necessary and, and so important for creativity. Be willing to experiment because not you cannot control every variable, right? So you might as well just take chances and see what comes out of those improvisations or experimentation. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, the, the truth is you're going to have to improvise whether you want to or not. So, you know, like you said, like you can't be completely prepared for everything and every conversation and everything that life throws at you. So you might as well learn some tactics about how to get, how to get better at it or at least how to get more comfortable in it because there's really no it's one of those things that it's part of life there's no way to there's no way to avoid that um another thing i wanted to ask you and this is probably like asking you to choose your favorite child or something but there are so many really interesting uh stories and examples from famously successful people of all types, right? Like artists, creators, business people. Uh, I'm curious, what's your favorite, what's your personal favorite of the stories that you share in the book? Uh, yeah, it's like asking me my favorite child for sure. I or think- either your favorite or the most surprising. What was the one, when you think back, cause I'm sure you did a ton of research for the book. What was the thing you came across that you were just kind of blown away by? Well, you know, one chapter uh, that I really enjoyed very much writing and I really liked it was the one on daydreaming because it actually allowed me not only to daydream myself a little bit more, but also I love everything that has to do with surrealism. I, have, I love everything that has to do with things that are outlandish because I think that if you are willing to go to those things that are impossible or outlandish, you're going to land somewhere, right? And so that you're going to find something really creative. And so I enjoyed writing a lot that chapter because, for example, I mention how um, Hieronymus Bosch, who painted the, the, you know, the Garden of Earthly Delights, he actually invented surrealism 600 years before the surrealists right because he was creating all this dreamlike features and creatures and things like that and i also i wrote a line that i love that says that before guillermo del toro was creating his oscar winning characters and whatever this guy was already making them you know and yeah. um and i love that and and here's why the and i hope this is also something that the readers take with them is that when we look back in history the same things that leonardo da vinci was doing are the same things that elon musk is doing right and so it's it's the the beauty of this is that it's a hundred percent human centric like we can do this and it, it's going to be with you for the longest time right because it's not about the renaissance it's not about modernism it's about habits and skills and i love to illustrate this pages with all these crazy examples because it's just showing you that this is something that will last in a hopefully this book will be a reference book that you keep coming back forever can you elaborate that's that's an i think an interesting idea the you know what you said about the same you know elon musk and leonardo da vinci were doing the same thing can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit Yes. So both Elon and, sorry, this thing is disconnecting. Uh, both Elon and uh, Da Vinci are uh, several times in the book, but they are in the chapter about curiosity because mm -hmm. I think that without curiosity, obviously there's no creativity. And it's like, that willingness to keep asking questions and more questions and more questions. Right. And so Da Vinci was a guide who, a guy who never really stopped asking questions. He had, he wrote, um, you know, his notebooks, whatever is left in the world is only 7,500 pages. 
And that's only about a quarter of what he wrote on those notebooks. There's, you know, and so he actually wrote questions and he was always looking to find the answer. And so, you know, what's the perimeter of Milan? How do you, you know, make a parachute? You know, he was the first one to design a parachute with exact Mm -hmm. proportions. It's just that it didn't materialize in his time. But mm-hmm. when he designed, he left all the measurements around. So he was always asking questions. And uh, there was a historian. His name is Kenneth Clark. He also died many years ago. And he say he said that Da Vinci was the guy who would never take yes for an answer because they will give him a, like the answer. He's like, that's not enough. I need another one, you know. And right. so, and this is kind of like how Elon Musk operates operates his business, operates his businesses and his life. He's always asking one more question. And one of the reasons why SpaceX exists is because he, although he's not a rocket scientist, he asks questions like why uh, is so expensive for the United States to send missions to outer space to the extent that the U.S. had to get this, the U.S. had to pay Russia to send people to outer space because it was so expensive to do it from here. And he's like, how come this country put the first man on the moon and we cannot send people to outer space? So he set out to figure out why. He called everybody, he took notes, he put a research team. And what's the bottom line of the story is that the there is no catch. It's the the all the contractors and subcontractors were charging such fees on top of you know whatever it is that they were doing for NASA that the prices became extraordinarily outrageous. But he's like, there's really no catch here. And I I want people to go with that and say, if you're seeing things, right? Like, and this is this is something you and I have talked about. Do yeah. not take anything at face value. When people give you an answer and you're not satisfied with it, go and look for another one. If there is a way to do things that you think you can do them better, please, by all means, try all the ways. I I said this in the book that if it's not illegal and if it's not against the laws of nature, what is preventing you from actually going after that, right? I mean, because we don't want anybody to do anything illegal and we don't want anybody to jump out of the window thinking that they're going to grow wings. We don't want that to happen. Of course not. But if it's not any of those things, why wouldn't you take that chance? Uh, Why wouldn't you ask that question? And I think that we have lost our ability to ask questions because we just take what's given to us by the media, by, you know, schools, parents. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, I think like, like you said, and it's also obviously their curiosity, but also their curiosity, not being constrained within a certain box of this is all that's possible. This is how it's done. Right. That, that really, you know, lots of people talk about sort of thinking with an open mind, but it's one thing to sort of think with an open mind within a box. It's another to really go, well, maybe anything's possible. Like maybe there's a totally different way of doing it. Maybe not, but just ask to your point, asking those questions and starting to consider, well, you know, why can't it be this way or operate this way or do something different? And I think that is again, not just with them, but I think it's something that's shared by almost all the people in your book. They have that willingness to sort of, not just assume that things have to operate the way they always have, right? Yes, and I say that many times, is challenge the status quo, right? Like challenge it for real. And every great invention, every great piece of progress that we have had in history came from people who actually were willing to challenge those ideas. And they were saying, you know, there is another way. And that is actually how progress happened is a contradiction, is juxtaposition of things and ideas. And Mm -hmm. that's why we need creativity, because without creativity, there is no progress. There is no personal progress and there is no societal progress either. So I know we're going to take questions in a second, but I have one. I think we'll end with one last question before we take other people's questions, which I'm sure will be better than mine. Uh, But what's uh, you spent? a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of research, everything working on this book. 
before writing the book, you spent a lot of time around artists and creativity and shifting your own career and all this sort of stuff. But I have to imagine the process of writing the book, there's been something that you come out of it believing or realizing that maybe you didn't know or think going into it. So what would be something that sort of you believe now about creativity that maybe you weren't aware of or didn't believe prior to writing this? Well, I think that, you know, I'm always open to uh, getting feedback and listening from people and so on and so forth. And, you know, books like the one I attempted to write, right, like which are guides, and I want the work to lead the way and say, look, there is so much here. But I think that, you know, as we are in a world that is invested in in finding answers, right, by, by scientists and uh, psychologists and whatnot, we're always finding new newer things and more things. And I, you know, obviously, maybe there will be another book about, but, I, you know, what is the thing that I, I just didn't know? Um, I'm not sure. I think that I have covered everything. I think one thing actually as a as a caveat is that I want people to feel that they are getting the most value that they can because they can see things differently. And that is one uh, a very important note for everybody is that this is not a book that is going to be telling you things that, you know, probably you already knew, or like, I want you to think about all this artists and entrepreneurs and ideas in a way where you are being fed information that allows you to think differently. And that is actually the cornerstone of creativity. If you do the same thing that everybody else is doing, there's nothing creative about that. If you just see things the way that you know everybody in your neighborhood or everybody in your group or everybody in your feed on instagram or whatever it, then you're not challenging yourself enough i don't necessarily think that there is anything that i have missed in the book i think that i have really given the most comprehensive guide and blueprint that i could have and uh and that's, you know, because I spend so much time obsessed with this topic, but it's obviously, it's up to the readers to interpret the information in the ways yeah. that serves them the most. And also along those lines with the Alchemy Lab exercises, it's kind of like everyone's going to have their own unique reading experience. Absolutely. Because if, if you do those things, yeah, everyone's going to sort of have this shared base of knowledge. But then when you go do those exercises, what you're going to get out of it and how you're going to do it, it will make, will, will also sort of make it relevant to each individual person's challenges or what they want to, what they want to get out of it, which I think is, is pretty cool. Well, um, congratulations again. Thank you, it's, Josh. It's an awesome book. I know you read. I mean, I just want to make sure everybody knows that actually Josh read the whole thing. I have absolutely read it. I would I yeah. would not be here talking about no, it. No, no, no. But I just want to make sure it. you guys know that he he was an early yeah. reader. Yeah. Um I, I give it thumbs up. Um, <laughs> so I think Mark was gonna maybe come on and take questions from people. Oh, there he is. Look at that. Hi, Mark. Hey. Magic we Mark. Just, we just <laughs> created, yeah, we just created Mark. See? Yeah, he's an avatar. <laughs> All right, so it looks like Thank our first you, question is from Craig Applebaum. And oh, he asks, hi, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> he asks, uh, what is the one thing we can do today to jumpstart our own inner creativity? Look, I think that honestly, one thing that people fail to do is to spend time alone in silence. And uh, there's a whole chapter in my book about silence. And uh, there's a whole other book in my book, and a whole other chapter in my book about uh, intuition. And, and uh, it's because we are so conditioned to be connected to our devices. And this kind of like, it's, it's like almost OCD or like, you know, a reflex, right? That we have always something happening that, okay, we wake up and then we go, the first thing we do is we check the phone and then we go on with our lives and, and the gym and noise and people and uh, streets and cities and whatever. And then the end of the day, that's it. You go to sleep, right? 
And uh, I think that if someone really wants to see miracles in their ideas, you have to spend at least at the very minimum five minutes a day and then increase it, obviously, to 10 uh, in silence. Uh, you know, look, a lot of people want to refer to this to meditation. I don't want to put labels because then some people are like, oh, but the meditation, I have to be in lotus position with a Buddha in front of me and incense. No, like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to put like all those barriers of entry, right? It's like, I consider that I, when I spend time alone in silence, my best ideas flourish, not necessarily at the time, but later, because there is something in in the creative process called the incubation effect, where you actually put your mind away from the problems that are keeping you busy and, and obsessed. And then, um, you know, you just like move away from that. And so when you move away from that, you let time to like just be alone in silence, no music, no nothing. And then later in the day or the day after, you may start seeing ideas come up. Right. Uh, our next question. Thank is, you, Greg, for being here. <laughs> uh, Susan Anthony asks, what was your greatest revelation about yourself from writing this book? Whew. Wow. Um, look, one of the greatest revelations is how much I love history. I really absolutely never thought I was going to get swallowed by the more than 300 books that I consulted um, in history. And uh, I mean, before I was like, oh my God, history. I mean, history is great, right? But I could never really like sit and like just read a history book. Um, like, But this gave me a whole other take on history and like the importance. It's not like people say, well, history repeats itself. Like, I don't like those cliches, like history repeats itself or, uh, you know, um, you know, history repeats itself and history teaches. The no, I, I like more the idea of what can I actually take from history that is timeless? That is one of the takeaways that were more important for me is like, I really think that we look at history to grab the things that humans that what makes us really human our habits and traits and skills that we keep working on ourselves no matter the age we are so that was a, a, a an important thing of how much i love history and the other thing is that you know the slowdown of the pandemic obviously put a lot of things in perspective and um, including, you know, me looking back at my childhood, uh, you know, a country that I have not been back in 16 years or more, 18 years and, uh, and how much uh, that fracture piece of my life is because it's, it's, that's, kind of erased in a way. And so when I discovered this video of my grandfather and I was able to see the house where I grew up, I was able to see my city where I was born again, that moved me so much. And it sort of like brought this feeling to me that as much as an American, that I am an American citizen and I feel really more American than anything, than anything that part of my life uh, will also have determine like who I am and, and like, you know, why I'm here. So that was actually very important. Right. And our last question is, uh, what's the biggest misconception people have about creativity? I think the biggest misconception is always that it's not, it doesn't belong to you, that it always, all other people have it, or that is, you know, for the artist that I'm not creative. You know, I, 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 I have a student, I, well, she already graduated from the program, but I, I mentioned her in the book. She is a real estate broker in Miami and uh, she came into the course like, I'm not creative. That's a thing that you're born with. And I don't have that, you know, and she ended up revitalizing her whole brokerage thing because she just gave up on so many rules and things that 
honestly were nonsense and uh, she started doing things very differently and so a really uh you know up like like the upward trend on her sales and whatnot because she was just really doing the things that she wanted to do so do not ever believe that you have a deficiency on your creative capabilities or that you don't have what it takes to be you know successful and creative because you actually do and i give you everything that you need in this book maria one last question uh, just for myself i'm curious uh what role do you see dreams as playing in creativity dreams yeah very important and um you know there there are a couple of things that i um i noted in the book one is automatic writing which was something that the surrealists used to do which is you know sometimes it was just as soon as they woke up they started to take in taking notes of it's like a mind up right like they uh, like they are just writing what comes out of their minds and putting them on paper and that actually helped with a lot of plays and arts uh, artworks and uh pieces of literature poetry whatever because you know we have that information from the surrealists and uh the other of uh, the chapter of daydreaming you know i encourage people to dream when they're awake but obviously it's it all comes from when we are not awake right i mean like the idea of daydreaming is because we are imagining things that can only happen when we are you know just sleeping and so i think that if you're the kind of person who can actually remember your dreams just always keep a notebook by your bed and take notes of that because the subconscious is such a fertile ground for ideas that you don't want to miss on that right if you're a writer if you are a filmmaker if you are in in business whatever you know like do pay attention to your dreams because there are very valuable pieces of information of who you are and uh and 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 all the things that you know you feel that could be outlandish like i said before the outlandish is the most amazing place for creativity because it, it there are things that haven't been done yet yet so maybe they can happen great uh it's also kind of proof uh because everyone dreams uh even if they don't remember it so uh creativity is not particular it's innate to us all absolutely you've said it um so that's a wrap on our presentation for this evening thanks again to our guests maria and josh and to everyone who tuned in this evening we greatly appreciate everyone's time and support of independent bookstores uh, to purchase a copy of this book, please click the green button below. Uh, it'll direct you to our site. Uh, yes. Yes, please buy yes. this book. Listen, I, I'm going to interrupt you, Mark. Uh, the independent bookstores really work so freaking hard during the pandemic to actually keep communities engaged and alive. Without the independent bookstores, we wouldn't have authors we, and, and the truth is, yes, technology has allowed for amazing things to happen in the world, but without this types of institutions like BookSoup, we would really, really have a hard time getting our messages out in the world. So it's, uh, it's expensive, it's West Hollywood, they have employees, help them. And uh, it, it's, it's about them more than about me. So if you don't like my book, buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but actually support them okay or if you don't like her book buy it for someone else yeah. <laughs> yes that too even, buy, even, buy it for somebody better. else yes um yes dude please i mean come on folks it's going to be what it's like 25 26 dollars plus tax and uh shipping or you can go to if you're in los angeles go and stop by hang out with them yeah, we are open for in-store browsing. Uh, so uh, come by. We'd love to see you. Uh, we also are doing in-person events starting in April. Uh, so if you'd like more information on that, uh, subscribe to our email newsletter. And that's going to be it for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, Maria. Thank and you. And thank you, Mark and Josh and everybody who came. I appreciate each one of you. And I 
wish uh, that all your desires and all your creative ideas come true.